na mention kanina that we started a new series last week. And uh, siguro para mas maging clear yung title ng series, instead of Worship Matters, I'd like to say it, Worship Matters. Meaning it's important. It's not matter in the sense that it's just one of the things we do. But it's Worship Matters. Last Sunday, I took you on a very broad survey of the Bible and outlining the four major storylines of the biblical story. And I hope I was able to show you that in each of the major storyline, the idea of worship was woven into it. Do you remember the four storylines? First is the creation of man in God's image. Second is the corruption of all things when sin entered the picture, that entered the creation of God. And then the third is the coming of Jesus Christ. That's the whole reason he's, He came because na corrupt yung creation of Panginoon and the relationship that we had with Him before was broken. And so we needed a Savior. And then after the coming of Jesus Christ, there's a picture in the book of Revelation in the consummation of the ages. And in all those four, four storylines, we see worship being woven from beginning to the end. The conclusion of that message was this. You and I were created for worship and to worship. God saved me so that my relationship with Him can be restored and I can once again become a true worshiper. All other outworking of the Christian life, whether it's evangelism or, the, or discipleship, ministry, my quiet time, prayer, you know, even the act of driving along our streets is an overflow of a life of worship. And Lynn, my wife, closed that message with a song entitled, I Was Made to Praise You. Today, I will attempt at a definition of worship. My family discovered early on that clear and concise definitions of words are important. Why? Because we found ourselves in many occasions arguing about a certain topic or issue, whether personal or trivial, only to discover that the root of our disagreement was a difference in the definition of a particular word. I don't know if you've realized that in many of your arguments or disagreements, either, either as a couple or as a family. One example is this word, clean. My wife would always instruct our son, Jael, um, to clean his room. <laughs> I had his permission, okay? <laughs> and Jael would agree to clean his room. <laughs> After a few hours, my wife would go in and inspect Jael's room. After inspection, Lynn would call Jael and tell him to clean it some more. But Jael would tell his mom that his room is already clean. And that's where the argument begins. The problem? My wife's definition of clean is worlds apart from Jail's definition of clean. <laughs> Jail's definition of clean, maayos, in order, and a symbolic sweeping of the floor. <laughs> maayos for him is nothing on the floor, table is clear, bed is fixed. Now, Lynn's definition of clean, maayos, malinis, at mabango. Kahit malinis dyan, pero pag inamoy niya at may amoy hindi masarap, hindi malinis yun. So she would run her fingers on the table or point a flashlight under the bed to check for dust. She would look behind the trash bin for traces of tissue papers. And she would take a deep breath inside this room for a smell check. 
Ako din, I had to learn Lynn's definition of clean. <laughs> We've been married for 30 plus years and early on, I had to learn that his, her definition of clean is so different from mine. My definition of clean and jail are the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only later years of my marriage that I had to learn Lynn's definition of clean. Now apply that to church. Your pastor welcomes everyone at the very start. And he says that we have gathered this morning to worship the Lord. Then the worship leader takes her place on stage and declares, Good morning, church. Why do you, don't we all stand and worship our God? After an hour and a half, the service concludes. You go home. Your father, your mother, your sister asks you where you went this morning. And your reply, oh, we went to, the wor we went to worship service. Now question, did they all mean the same thing? That's where the divisions in the church happens. Churches divide because of worship. And it's sad because by definition, if a church is a worshiping church, then such things should not happen. The moment the word worship becomes a divisive issue in the church, then that church ceases to be a worshiping church. Now, we'll come back to this example later. First thing I would like to do this morning is to ask you to write down your definition of worship. Siguro kahit sa phone nyo lang, i-type nyo. What is your personal definition of worship? Okay? I'll give you two hours. <laughs> Baka gumawa pa kayo ng thesis paper. Just a short statement, a short definition. Or sige, isipin nyo na lang if it's something that you can remember later on. But I want you to try and write down your definition of worship or think about your definition of worship. Now, don't think about what other pastor you heard define the word or what you read before. Bawal Google. Bawal ang copy-paste. Okay? Personal definition. Now, in, in, in case you get lost in thinking, oh nga, no, ano bang definition ko ng worship? Well, I hope that we can have a picture of what worship is today. If last week, ang, ang big picture natin is to see that worship is the foundation of everything we are and everything we do, today, pag-usapan natin, eh, ano nga bang worship? If it's the foundation of everything we are, everything to do, then I need to know my definition of worship. Somebody wrote, I realize that definitions can create problems as well as solve them. The English novelist Samuel Butler wrote that definition is the enclosing of a wilderness of idea within a wall of words. And then the writer said, my favorite example of that is Samuel Johnson's famous definition of network. Anything reticulated or decassated at equal distances with interstices between the intersections. <laughs> Talk about wilderness. Kung ganyan ang definition mo ng worship, you'll be lost. After 11 chapters of deep theological insights from the Apostle Paul's pen, after discussing things previously hidden from the minds of new believers, after thinking that Paul surely had God figured out because he had this personal revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? After 11 chapters in the book of Romans, he throws up his hands with a deep sigh of frustration. This is what he said in Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. 
Amen. Paul is basically saying after 11 chapters of pure doc, deep doctrine, guys, you know what? I still don't know God. <laughs> I still don't know God. There's so much to know about Him. Another writer said, Many have struggled with finding an adequate definition of worship. Praise is not hard to define, but worship is another matter. No one definition seems to adequately express the fullness of worship, perhaps because worship is a divine encounter and so is, a, is as infinite in its depth as God Himself. Another theologian wrote, Christian worship defies definition. It can only be experienced. However, like every other kind of experience, it calls for analysis and understanding. So, where did our word worship come from? It came from an old English word, worship, denoting the worthiness of one receiving the special honor or devotion. In fact, uh, UK, you would still hear people say, your honor, or even here when talking to the judge, okay, your honor. The two terms, worship and worthy, may be seen together in the grand description of 24 elders falling down before the one who sits on the throne. Revelation 4.11, it says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Revelation 5.12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Warren Worsby again wrote, We worship whichever or whomever we deem worthy. Man is not worthy of worship, and certainly the idols that man makes are not worthy. Only God is worthy of our worship. What a person worships is a good indication of what is really valuable to him. So if you find yourself worshiping your position, then that means that is what is most valuable to you. If you find yourself worshiping your possessions, you're finding it hard to share it with others, that means that is the most important thing to you. Now, there are four Hebrew words translated as worship in the King James Version. But the one that is most often used is shaka. It is used 94 times, shaka. It literally means to bow down, to depress, prostrate oneself before a superior in homage. Its first occurrence, nandun sa Genesis 18.2, when Abraham was visited by angels. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. That's the picture of that word. Now, in the New Testament, the principal word for worship is proskuneo. It literally means to kiss the hand or the ground. It conveys the idea of showing reverence or doing obeisance to God. Now, this is the oriental practice of bowing down or laying prostrate on the ground. You know, one of the things I realized the, the act of bowing down has a very deep picture that is being conveyed. When you bow low before a person who is worthy of homage, you are actually in a position that you are most vulnerable. You're telling that person, I am yours, totally yours. And during the olden times, they actually can say, if you want to cut off my head, I'm yours. You can do with me whatever you want. Union position of bowing low before a person. It's an utter letting go of everything for, to that person. Noting the nuances of the words used for worship, both in the Old and New Testaments, you get the broader picture of worship as a total and wholehearted surrender, embracing the value of both the heart, which is the attitudes, and the hands, service, and actions. When I say, I worship God, it should only mean that I have given everything 
to Him my life, my ambitions, my goals, my relationships, my career, my emotions, my thoughts, my worldly treasures. Some people have defined worship as this. Worship is the response of all that man is, body, mind, will, emotions, to all that God is, says, and does. Yung word yan is the response of all that man is, meaning it involves my total being. I don't worship only with my mind. I also worship with my heart. I worship with my body. In fact, sa New Testament, there's a Greek word that is used to translate into the English word worship, which is the word latreo. And latreo is a word meaning the service that you give to God in the temple. So all of those things are embodied in worship. Another person defined worship as practicing the very presence of God in all areas of our life. Now, what does it mean to practice the very presence of God in all areas of our life? You know, I had a very wonderful experience or uh, uh, enlightenment regarding that concept of worship. One of those rare moments, my wife and I were separated for about a few days. Kasi, ano kami, para kaming kambal eh. We go everywhere together, except the bathroom. <laughs> Worship is practicing the very presence of God in all areas. So when we were separated for a while, I was in Davao. She was in here in Manila. And my friend in Davao, sabi niya in one of our downtime, sabi niya, Roy, palabas ngayon sa sine tong ano, movie. Let's watch, sabi niya. And I was thinking, oh nga no, gusto kong panoorin yung movie na yun. And before I said yes, I suddenly realized na pinag-usapan namin ng wife ko that we're gonna watch the movie together. Pero wala yung wife ko. And so, nisip ko, we can watch the movie and then pag uwi ko, I can act like hindi ko napanood. And so, while it were, we, pag nandun kami sa sinihan, oh, wow! Oh, paano nangyari yun? Uy, ang galing! Alam mo, pwede akong umarte, di ba? Without her knowing. Di ba? Okay lang. But the more I realized, the more I na, na conscience ako na I cannot lie to my wife. And so I told my friend, kapatid, ibang movie na lang. And so we watched another movie. That is practicing the very presence of my wife <laughs> in my life. Even when I'm driving, when I'm alone. Every time I leave the house, she tells me, Roy, cool-headed, okay? Drive safe. And so when I'm driving, when I'm alone, and I'm tempted to bump the motorcycle rider in front of me, the voice of my wife sitting beside me in the front, Roy, <laughs> cool-headed, okay? <laughs> That's what it means to practice the very presence of God. Whatever you do, wherever you go, you're cleaning your clothes, you're sweeping the floor. Kanina, dito, yung mga kids, they were cleaning this area. It means practicing the presence of God. Now, another, another person defined it this way. Worship of the living God, living and true God, is essentially an engagement with Him on the terms that He proposes and in the way that He alone makes possible. Now, what I like about this definition is the idea that worship begins with God. Worship begins with God. Pag hindi sa kanya nagsimula yung concept natin of worship, you will go astray and your worship will not reflect biblical worship. So years ago, I was thinking, so Lord, in light of everything that I've been studying about worship, what is my definition of worship? And this is where, what I have arrived at. Worship is relationship in action. 
Worship is relationship in action. Meaning, worship begins with a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end with the establishment of that relationship. Action, it means that that relationship is ongoing, ever-evolving, never static, transforming. Marriage does not begin and end with our wedding vows on our wedding day. Okay? Hindi porque, ay, napangasawa ko na siya. I can do whatever I want. Hindi na niya ako pwede hiwalayan. <laughs> hindi po, hindi, hindi po ganun ang marriage. Marriage begins at that point and one hopes that that marriage will grow deeper and more meaningful as the husband and the wife practice daily their roles in that marriage. Right? If I don't practice my role as a husband to my wife on a daily basis, guess what will happen? Exactly. <laughs> there will be quiet in the house. <laughs> she will not talk to me. <laughs> she will ignore me. She will look the other way. When she eats, she's gonna look at her food and not sa akin. Di ba ang sad? To live in a house na ganun, you live with somebody, you're supposed to be married to her, and yet the relationship is not working. It's the same with God. Worship is relationship in action. Relationship is a requirement for worship because worship is a two-way street involving both giving and receiving. You know, God's will for my life is that I be in relationship with Him. This is the reason God sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. Throughout the Bible, the people of Israel as well as New Testament believers were always described as people in a relationship with God. You know, hindi lang tinawag ni God yung, yung Israel as my people. This relationship has been described in various ways using many pictures that we can easily relate to. According to Matthew 22 verse 37, the basis and foundation of our relationship with God is love. And based on what we have just studied, the outworking of this love relationship is what we call worship. Look at Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Nakita mo doon? Ang daming descriptions na ginamit to describe our relationship with God. He did not just call them His people. He described them as the sheep of His pasture. Worship then is our love for God expressed. And a relationship is not something you turn on and off, right? Just like my example kanina, even when I'm in, I was in Davao, hindi ko pwedeng sabihin, Uy, bachelor ako ngayon. I can do whatever. Yay! Wala asawa ko. Diba hindi pwede yun? Wherever I go, whatever time of day, whether I'm sleeping or taking a bath or driving down the road, I am the husband of Lynn. In fact, that's how many times I'm being introduced. <laughs> Kasi Lynn is the worship leader, so she must visible on stage than I, uh, than I am. So many times, yung mga host namin, they forget my name and they introduce me. Oh, this is... This is the husband of Lynn. <laughs> I know she doesn't like that uh, no, introduction. <laughs> but that's, that's the reality. You are a child of God 24-7. Which means that you being a child of God 24-7, you are a true worshiper 24-7. And that is not something we can compartmentalize. I'm realizing that not very many Christians know this as God's will for their lives as well. Why? One, 
we have defined worship as an event. What we often define as worship is really just an event, just like my, my opening script kanina, when the pastor welcomes you, welcome to our worship service. It's an event. There's a beginning, there's an end. Something that happens at some point in time. And we come away from a worship service and say, wow, I have worshipped God this morning. What was our basis? I was present. Dun, sa crossroads redeemed. 10 to 11.30. So I worship. Many times I wonder if this is the attitude that some people have taken. You often see people walking around, talking with others, or texting while the service is ongoing. Worship is more than just an event. Another is that we have defined worship as something we do. I prayed, therefore I worshiped. I sang with Sister Tiff Kanina, therefore I worshiped. I just led worship, or I just preached God's word, therefore I worshiped. I remember one time we were leading an event for a big gathering of Christian evangelicals. And uh, during the singing, talagang people were so engaged with God. And there's this one lady very near the front. And she was really raising her hand and oh, crying out while singing. Talagang kita mo tears falling down her cheeks. And then uh, after the closing song, she sat down, wiped her face, and then started going through her Facebook. Why? Tapos na worship. She just engaged in worship, which was to sing. There's a practice in some churches. I'm glad it doesn't happen here. <laughs> But there are some people in other churches, pagkatapos ng worship team maglead, the band will go down and the singers, you know what, where some of them go after? Tindahan, magmimirienda, habang the worship service is ongoing. And then tatawagin sila, Uy, closing song na! Closing! Ay, oh! Um, um, takbo! And then they sing a song to close. And then they go home. Worship is more than just what we do. For God. The third is that we have delegated the responsibility of worship to others. Many times we hear this comment, Nako, hindi ako naka-worship kanina sa service. Ano ibig sabihin ng mga nagsasabing ganun? They're either blaming the worship leader because he or she was out of tune, or they were not moved by the choice of songs. They were blaming the preacher or they were blaming the sound technician. Lakas naman ng tunog. Grabe naman yun. Sakit sa tenga. Di mga ganun tayong ano, feedback. And so we delegate the responsibility of worship to others. If they don't do their part, hindi ako maka-worship. Or if somebody distracts me, then I cannot worship. I remember that one time, it's, it's a practice of Lynn and I, when, it's not, when we don't have a part in the program, we try to sit at the back so we can observe the congregation. Try to be in the middle para ma feel namin what the church is like. And so one time in our church, we sat in, near the end of the sanctuary. And while we were singing, talaga namang hindi ako makakfocus. Kasi sa likod ko, I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Talagang, Lord, <laughs> ang hirap. So tumahimik na lang ako. I was planning to, to uh, I was thinking, what should I do? Should I talk to the person or what? And so after... When we were asked to sit down, pasimple ako. <laughs> and you know what? I saw a person, a PWD behind me, 
And he's, he's the type of sickness na nakaganon siya. And so he was singing his best with how he was at that point. And sabi ko, grabe Lord, siya naka-worship, ako hindi. And it's because of my wrong heart. I was blaming him for not being able to worship when in fact, it was my heart that was not right before God. If we are to put a relationship in action and become 24-7 worshipers, we need to understand some basic things. First, God called us His children. In John, John, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Okay, this, this is something we cannot just shed off because it was given to us the right to become children of God. In Galatians 3.26, it says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Second, God seeks worshipers, not worship. God seeks worshiper, not worship. In John chapter 4, verse 19, the encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman, when the Samaritan woman realized that she was talking to a prophet, sabi niya, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, what's wrong with her argument? The Samaritan woman referred to worship as something they did in some place they went to. And so Jesus gave a contrasting description in his words. Jesus declared in verse 21, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. No more bothering about places of worship. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Psalm 51, verses 16 to 17 it says there, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. No matter how perfect your offering to the Lord is, if you inside are not right with the Lord, either because of sin or because you are worshiping a different God in your mind, then that sacrifice is not acceptable to Him. Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The Lord didn't say, offer your bodies as dead sacrifices, meaning kill yourself on the altar and make yourself as an, a dead offering. This, sabi niya, I want a living sacrifice, meaning you, 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 alive, vibrant, breathing. And that's the kind of worshiper the Lord wants. The third is we are God's temple, not a multi-purpose hall. A multi-purpose hall kasi is pwede mo i-transform according to what you want to use it, how you want to use it. Pwede mong going ballroom dancing floor, pwede mong going uh, for a program, for anything, or you can make it into a worship hall. But God's temple is unique. It's dedicated. It's consecrated. Nothing happens there except worship. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body 
is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If I am a temple of God, it only means 24-7 what happens in me should be in line with worship. Hindi ako multipurpose hall na pagkatapos natin mamaya, I'm free to be a road, road rager. And God doesn't care because I've already finished worshiping God. No, He cares. Because while I'm out there, I'm still a temple of God. And lastly, God made us priests, not mere attenders. 1 Peter 2.9, it says there, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Again, the calling of a priest is for a lifetime. I'm not a priest only on a Sunday. I can be a preacher on a Sunday morning, yes, but I am a priest all the time, 24-7. Again, what is our working definition of worship? Let's all read. Relationship in action. Let's read one more time. Relationship in action. Now, Jesus died in your behalf so that you may live as a result of faith and repentance. He has given you a second chance as well. Your relationship with God was restored. He called you His children, His worshiper, His temple, His priest. Have you ever said to God, I am yours forever? I'd like to call on Lynn to lead us in a song that talks about this very thing between the Lord Jesus Christ and us. This is a familiar song, I think, to many of you, so please do join me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. My joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine! I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor yet rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead 
Just bow our heads. Worship is relationship in constant action. As you look back into your lives right now, and you sense that that relationship, you have not lived that relationship in constant motion, in constant connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you sense and the Lord is revealing to you that some parts of your life was not lived in worship, meaning He's not part of your business, or maybe He's not part of your choice of a girlfriend or boyfriend. If He was not part of your daily commute when you go to school or you go to church or you go to your work, if you see that He was not part of your decisions. This is a time for you to say, Lord, just like Jacopo, I'd like to say, I am fully yours forever. If that is the sentiment of your heart right now, just pray to the Lord. Lord, please forgive me that I have left out some areas of my life and sealed them off from you. But now I realize that if I am to be a worshiping follower of Christ, then everything has to be under your feet. And so, Lord, here I am. I am yours forever. Pray a prayer, something like that. If that is the cry of your heart at this very moment, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Let's pray. Lord, I can only say that when someone gives himself or herself fully to you, 
that will be an amazing adventure because we will experience something we've never experienced before. The full outpouring of your hand of blessing on that person. And we recognize, Lord, it doesn't mean that life will become so flowery and stress-free. It might even mean that more challenges will come our way, more temptations, more ridicule from our office mates when they see us so committed to you in worship that even in the office, we practice what it means to be a worshiper of God. Lord, we may invite people to ridicule us, but that's okay as long as everything is yours. So I pray for anyone and everyone who recommitted themselves today, Lord. May you honor that commitment and help us to be accountable regarding that commitment. Help us to share it with somebody so that someone can check up on us, pray for us, and who can rejoice with us, Lord, whenever we experience a season of victory in our spiritual walk with you. We thank you that you love us fully. You never gave short of what we needed. You gave everything. You gave your son to be our sacrifice for, our, for the penalty of our sin. And so we give back to you, Father, all glory and all praise. In Jesus' name, amen.